The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. And welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley, and with me tonight is Father William Jenkins. He's a member of the Society of St. Pius V. He's also the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church right here in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you? Very fine, Tom. Thank you. And yourself? Doing well, Father. Thanks for being here. Very well. Father, I wanted to begin with this uh, email. Uh, rather, it's, it's an interview that uh, we were sent a link to. This is with Father David Davide Pagliarani, the Superior General of the Society of St. Pius X. The interview is posted on their website. I, I wanted to pick through a little bit of it because it's, it's rather interesting to read through this and, and read some of Father Pagliarani's responses to the questions from the interviewer. Uh, Father, you and I both have kind of skimmed through a lot of this interview, and one of the things that really stood out to me is uh, it, it seems that Father Pagliarani is very extremely hesitant to in any way criticize Francis. The, uh, the interviewer kind of presses him on this point, what, what exactly do you think of Francis? How do you uh, quantify and qualify all of these reforms of Francis? And it seems almost that Father Pagliarani is going through some kind of mental gymnastics and all of these justifications to avoid directly criticizing Francis. And just to give a few uh, snippet quotes from the interview to illustrate this point, uh, once to begin with here, Father Pagliarani says, the liturgical reform of Vatican II was only the culmination of an experimental development that dated back to the interwar period and had already penetrated a large part of the clergy. In another place, uh, talking about Amoris Laetitia, he says, This catastrophic document was wrongly presented as the work of an eccentric and provocative personality, what some want to see in the current Pope. This is not true, and it is inappropriate to simplify the question in this way. Uh, in another place, he says, Amoris Laetitia is one of the results that, sooner or later, was to occur as a result of the principles laid down by the Council. And there are several other quotes throughout the interview, Father, along this, this same line, where he just seems to say that Amoris Laetitia, Francis, all of his reforms, they're just the logical conclusion of, of Vatican II. So what do you make of that, Father? Because in one, one sense, this seems to be absolutely true. This is what you have said, that Francis and his modernism is just the logical result, uh, the inevitable, unavoidable result and conclusion of the principles laid down in Vatican II. Yet, it seems that Father Pagliarani, uh, he doesn't make the next logical step from that, which would be to reject the principles of Vatican II and reject the, the, the post-conciliar church and not have anything to do with it. So how do you, how do you interpret these, these words of Father Pagliarani? Well, if uh, Father Pagliarani is making the point that the principles expressed at the Second Vatican Council have led to... Francis and what Francis is now doing, I would have to agree with him to that extent. That, right. Because the principles laid down at Vatican II were the principles of modernism, which as St. Pius X made very clear in his encyclical Pacenti Dominici Gregis of September 8, 1907, is not Catholicism, but it is, as St. Pius X himself said, the synthesis of all heresies. That's the summation, the succinct summation of St. Pius X's treatment of modernism, an explanation of modernism, that one must see that it is the synthesis of all heresies. And so um, we, we have to look for the origins of what we're witnessing now in Francis, what Francis is now doing, what Francis is now saying, we have to look for the origins of the Novus Ordo, the New Order religion, uh, in Vatican II, in the modernism of Vatican II. I agree with Father Pagliarani exactly on that point. Mm -hmm. It's a point we're trying to drive home to the conservative <clears throat> Novus Ordo Catholics who still have the faith in their hearts, but they're actually practicing the Novus Ordo. 
trying to find, let's say, the most conservative flavor of uh, manifestation of the Novus Ordo, uh, but it nonetheless is the new order they're practicing because uh, they can't seem to uh, accept the fact, face the fact, that the voice that is commanding them to practice the Novus Ordo is not the voice of Christ. And rather that it is that the Nova Sordo is pr the product of the enemies of the church, the modernists, okay? But uh, having said that, that I agree with Father Padirani to that extent, I agree that there's something very important missing in his analysis. And uh, that something very important is to say that it, it is actually ignoring the fact that Francis is the man the modernists are counting on right now to bring Vatican II to its ultimate conclusion. So much so that they are desperately protecting him from criticism and they're, they're actually uh, desperately protecting him from the consequences even of his subversion of the entire hierarchy, even of the Novus Ordo, by homosexuals uh, predators, those who favor them, those who project them, those who protect them. I mean, he, he, even today, Francis continues to remote uh, into positions of authority in the, in the New Order Church, men who are blatantly pro-homosexual and who have track records of protecting them and promoting them themselves, even today. So... <clears throat> Um, the reason why they are letting Francis go on, on, on this rampage uh, within the Novus Ordo Church is uh, because they are counting on him to fulfill the purpose for which the St. Gallen Mafia chose him, anointed him, and uh, by their under-the-table machinations got him elected. And that is that this man is so much a modernist that he is, and he's so reckless, he's going to bring Vatican II to its ultimate conclusion, which is the complete, well, in their mind, the utter annihilation of the Catholic Church and the obliteration of the Catholic religion and its replacement with a new faith, modernism, and a new religion, the new order. Uh, or what uh, this gentleman, Ettore Gotti Tedeschi, says, and says very well, is nothing but Gnostic environmentalism. We see that throughout in what Francis is doing now. He's all in. He has actually thrown himself all into this at the Amazon Synod, and recently calling for the nations of the world to subscribe to this uh, new educational globalism pact that he wants them all to sign by May of next year. It's all about this Gnostic environmentalism. He's calling it humanism. It's actually putting man in the place of God, the <clears throat> Gnosticism. <clears throat> and uh, Father Pagliarani just doesn't seem to uh, face the fact that the ultimate expression of modernism is the synthesis of all heresies, and that is precisely what Francis represents. The man is the embodiment of modernism right now, taken to its ultimate conclusions. But St. Pius X said that's the synthesis of all heresies, and Father Pagliarani should face that fact and say, okay, we see this progression since Vatican II of the principles of Vatican II being enacted more and more, putting more and more in effect. <clears throat> And all of these developments, and Morris Letizia and so on, they're all developments of these principles. Agreed. But where they're leading, and where they have led right now, is to a man who really synthesizes all heresies in his thinking. And there are consequences to that realization. Father Pagliarani actually leads us to the threshold of that. But he will not cross the threshold. He won't even allow anyone to think beyond that threshold of what that actually means in terms of the necessary, the inevitable conclusions now. He's talking about the conclusions of the principles of Vatican II, 
but he will not face those conclusions himself. Mm-hmm. And Father, I think another point that needs to be made is you've said this before that if one has a sickness, sure, it is important to, to figure out the root cause uh, of the problem, but one can also die by not treating the symptoms of the problem. So it's mm-hmm. true that Francis, yes, he's just a symptom of a much deeper problem, but at the same time, we still must deal with this very, very serious symptom that, that we're Francis facing. Francis is not a symptom, but that's, that's the mistake Father Pagliari's making. He's treating him as though he's a symptom. Francis is actually the poisoner. He's the one who is actually administering the poison now to every last vestige of Catholicism that he can that he can reach. Mm-hmm. So um, no, Francis is not a symptom. He is the disease. He embodies now modernism. He is the carrier. He is, uh, what do they call it in, um, in, in the CDC when they have a disease that spreads out from one individual? They take it back to patient zero or something like that, right? But he now is the man, is the point man for the modernists, who is going to abuse, right, the appearance of what he calls the Petrine office in order to um, obliterate the, the vestiges of Catholicism left in the Novus Ordo. <clears throat> even, even some of these uh, conservative Novus Ordo commentators now are expressing doubts about the papacy, the, pap- the papal office itself, because they say Francis is the Pope, and look at what he's doing. So this obviously means that a pope can do all of these evil things. So what is the papacy? It's dissolved. And this is actually what Francis is trying to do in the minds even of the people who still have the faith within the Novus Ordo. He's trying to destroy the very concept of the papacy itself. And he's being very successful at it. So, um, you know, uh, those who would uh, hold fast to the traditions of the church and have others do so also are going to have to come to fa- to grapple with that with this, this the reality of Francis and who he really is and what he's really doing. He's promoting a, a pagan religion here to replace the, the Catholic religion. They have to deal with the, the, the logical consequences of that. Well, okay, Father, well, after having established that point then, that Francis is the problem, modernism, Vatican II, that is the problem. Wouldn't the next logical step be we need to reject this, we need to reject the Second Vatican Council and modernism and Francis? Absolutely. And Father Pagliarani might say, okay, well, we need to re- reject Vatican II and the principles promoted in Vatican II. But why can't he say that now? But Francis is the embodiment of those. Francis is like the warhead that contains this nuclear you know, destructive element here. Uh, I think he, I think in the interview he even talks about Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Right. And Hiroshima. And talks about the, these bombs going off, okay? Mm-hmm. Francis is, what did they call the, uh, what did they call the first atomic bomb? Did they call it Fat Boy? Fat, what did, what did, fat they called it Fat Man or something fat like that. <laughs> Francis is that bomb in the church right now. And uh, if Father Pagliarani is going to say, <clears throat> look, <clears throat> all of these principles laid down at Vatican II and before, they were festering, mm-hmm. okay, in the church before Vatican II. Why is this even news? I don't understand. We've been saying this for years now. Mm-hmm. But St. Pius X himself said this. He himself has said the modernists are already in 1907 in the very veins of the church, in the very lifeblood of the church there at work. He said that. This is back in 1907, Tom. He even said that the reason why he wrote the encyclical to publicly denounce the modernists is because he had been working for years to recall them from their modernism. So he was saying that the modernists had been at work long before he even became the pope. So no wonder. I mean, these principles are a bit at work. We can even trace them back to the 
permanent instruction of the Alta Vendita, when uh, Nubius, probably Mazzini, in Italy, set the Masonic lodges of Italy about infiltrating the papacy. And in fact, in short order, they had Mastai Ferretti, who became Pope Pius IX, and was widely regarded to be probably a Mason himself. This was just maybe 30 years after the Masons began, uh, 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 actually came out and, uh, and actually laid down their plan as far as uh, in infiltrating the papacy. The point being this, we know that these things have been at work in the church. St. Pius X already told us that. It doesn't help really for, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not really revealing anything that we shouldn't already know. Unfortunately, there are so many people who don't know it or don't face it that it does need to be said. Uh, and so I don't fault Father Pagliarani for saying it at all. But what I don't understand is how he doesn't understand the fact that if what he's saying is true, we've come to the ultimate conclusions now, where uh, Francis is, is, is going for broke to finally seal the doom of the church, as Maradiaga says, his own cardinal advisor. He says, Francis now wants to make this revolution irreversible. And Francis is going for broke. He is, he is hellbound on this mission to drive this stake through the heart of the church that he despises. <clears throat> to drive these nails through the hands and feet of our Lord of the cross and, ha and hang our Lord on the cross unto death. He wants to kill the traditional Catholic Church. He wants to destroy the traditional Catholic faith <clears throat> by bringing the principles of modernism to their ultimate conclusion. <clears throat> this synthesis of all heresies means that this is what Francis is. That's what he represents. This is the person he is right now. <clears throat> and Father Pagliarani has to then face the fact, well, who is this man, this Francis now? Rather than just say, well, you know, he's just kind of following through on principles that were laid down before, so we just can't, uh, you know, have too much to say about him, and, that's, and leave it at that. Actually, he starts his interview, doesn't he, by saying, we're on the verge of something catastrophic. Right. Okay. He even quotes uh, uh, Maradiaga, saying Francis's goal is to make this irreversible, the destruction that Francis has caused. It's as though, time and time again in this interview, Father Paul Yorani goes up to the edge and then backs away. And um, again, this is um, something that, it, that is not helping. It's, it's keeping traditional Catholics divided. And it, it is a manifestation, I'm afraid, of his intent to still find a way to hold on to some kind of approval, to hold on to some kind of a, uh, like there's a line he will not cross with regard to, to Francis, because he fears losing whatever favor he has in the Vatican. And that is very dangerous. That's putting it mildly. Father, at another point in the interview, uh, Father Pagliarani is asked his opinion of the many voices that have been raised against Francis and his reform, and uh, the interviewer asks, how do you rate these reactions? And uh, Father Pagliarani says that the Society of St. Pius X has a duty to be very attentive to these reactions, and at the same time to try to avoid misguidedness and failure to achieve anything. Uh, so he, he says that these reactions systematically come up against a brick wall and one must have the courage to ask why. So it almost seems as if he's saying that, that the, these voices raised against Francis, they're, they're worthless, they're useless um, because they're failing to achieve anything. But it's interesting, he, he says in here at one point, uh, talking about these uh, reactions to the reforms of Francis, he says, quote, these reactions have the advantage and merit of showing that the voice that advocates these errors cannot be that of Christ, nor that of the magisterium of the church. What do you think about that, Father? Okay. What does he think about that? His own words. That the voice 
The voice, read it again, please, Tom. Exactly, word for word. These reactions have the advantage and merit of showing that the voice that advocates these errors cannot be that of Christ nor that of the magisterium. The voice that the advocates church. these errors cannot be that of Christ or the magisterium of the church. Right. So he's telling us that Francis is not speaking with the voice of Christ or the magisterium of the church. Okay. But why doesn't he just come out and, and state, you know, the obvious then? Because, you see, one could take that, and one could say, well, you know, what he's saying here is that Francis, when he speaks these errors, he's just speaking as a private theologian. He's just speaking as a private individual. So, I mean, popes can do that, right? And still be popes. Um, when they come up with errors, there have been popes in the past who have spoken as private theologians, right? And have spoken errors. So this is a, a way of dismissing the gravity of, the, of, the, of the, the very statement that he made here. The problem is, though, that Francis is not just speaking error. He's speaking blasphemy, right? right? He's advocating something more than mere error. The synthesis of all heresies is the systematic uh, destruction of all of the doctrines, the defined dogmas of the Catholic Church. That's what the synthesis of heresy is. This is apostasy. Now here you have Cardinal Novus Ordo, Cardinal Braunbitter, saying that the document, the Instrumentum Laboris, the working document on the Synod of the Amazon, is apostasy. Here you have Cardinal Mueller saying the same thing, that this represents apostasy. They're speaking the truth in that. This, the synthesis of all heresies is a denial of all the truths of the faith. That is what we call apostasy, right? Okay. So, uh, but for some reason, we can't seem to get that out of these quasi-traditional groups that are trying so hard to remain in the good graces of the Vatican. The Institute of Christ the King, the Fraternity of St. Peter, they have got to be careful what they say and tiptoe around and not, not state the truth for fear of what will happen to them. So we have this very peculiar situation now, where the, the conservative Novus Ordo are the ones who are actually accusing Francis of heresy, and even apostasy. And you have the traditional, would-be traditional groups, who are afraid to come out and say it. And even, Tom, as you say, and as Father Pagliari says, say, well, that's counterproductive, that doesn't help, to accuse him of these things. St. Pius X said modernism is the synthesis of all heresies. We have to keep repeating that. Do you understand the gravity of what you're getting at here? Right. And, uh, but, I mean, it's as though the, the, the would-be traditional groups are not willing to say that, even while the conservative Novus Ordos are coming out and saying it. But here's the problem. He's saying <clears throat> in his interview, Father Pagliarani is saying, look, they hit a brick wall. They hit a brick wall. I would say that the Society of St. Pius X is the brick wall they're hitting. I would say the Institute of Christ the King is the brick wall they're hitting. I would say the Institute of Christ the King and Fraternity of St. Peter are both the brick wall they're hitting. Why? Because these conservative Catholics still have the faith and are horrified by, by what is being done in the Vatican. They're horrified by the modernism. They're trying to denounce it Precisely for what it is, as heresy and apostasy. And they're not getting the support that they should have from these would-be traditional Catholic groups who are afraid to risk their necks, as it were, on the Vatican chopping block. They have too much to lose right now to speak the truth to power. And so they are not only silent, but they're even criticizing those who are sounding the alarm okay. of heresy and apostasy. <laughs> and so what this has done, as I pointed out before, is just embolden Francis to say, he doesn't have to listen to any of these people. He can move ahead anyway. Why? Because he's neutralized everybody. The conservative Novus Ordo people who are accusing uh, him and his synods and so on of heresy and apostasy have all kind of mutually agreed there's nothing to be done. He's the Pope. So heresy, even apostasy, there's nothing we can do. Let them cry 
shout fire all they want. Let them cry heresy. Let them cry apostasy. They already have this mutual agreement. I mean, our bishops, Schneider basically told them, told them, look, there's nothing you can do about this. So he has nothing to fear from them. And the Society of St. Pius X, the Fraternity of St. Peter, the Institute of Christ the King, and any other would-be traditional Catholic group is cowed to silence because they all need his, in their own mind, need his okay to function. They're trying to remain in his, in his good graces and not to be crushed, as Francis has crushed some of these groups already, making it very clear to them that he has the power to just crush them in an instant. Right. So he's neutralized them too. They can criticize all they want Vatican II and say Francis is a result of Vatican II. But in the end, they dare not cross that line when it comes to him and who he is and what he's doing to the church. They still have to holy father him to death and bow and bow and kiss the pontifical slipper in the, in the ring and, and just basically tell everybody, but we still have to acknowledge him and we still have to go along and remi remind ourselves always that he is the vicar of Christ on earth. Even if much of the time he doesn't speak like it, he still is. So, you see what I mean? That's why I'm saying that when Father Pagliarani is saying, he say, you know, the people who try to denounce what's happening hit the brick wall. It's not what he says here. That they're, well, it's a democratic church and, you know, you can have all this dissent and, you know, this is just one voice or dissent coming from one direction. And so it blunts the effect, effect of these things. That's how I understand what he's saying here. It's, that's not it. That's not it at all. What it is, is the people who should be helping are not helping. It reminds me of the Bay of Pigs. I'm sorry, it does. You had have, you have the fighters land on the ground, right? They were on the ground, ready to fight. And they were not given the, the air support. And so they were all betrayed into their deaths, you know? And Castro did whatever he pleased. Because the air support was, was called off, which would help. And I would consider the FSSP and the, F, the SSPX and the Institute of Christ, they should be the air support. They're not. Mm -hmm. And so when these conservative Nova Sotos are on the ground trying to confront the heresy and confront the apostasy, they're left without that support. They're betrayed by the silence um, for what, the, what they will not say in support of them. They're even criticizing them for, for trying. Well, Father, la the last point I wanted to get to in this interview, really quickly if we could, because I wanted to try and, and get to a couple emails. Uh, this last point, though, the interviewer asks uh, Father Padirani towards the end of the interview what the Society of St. Pius X proposes positively, rather than just the negative of, of criticizing what kind of positive concrete actions do they propose. And uh, Father Pagliarani says simply that our, our goal is just to transmit what we have received. Uh, at another point he says that uh, we must embrace the Catholic Mass and draw all the consequences from it, let the Mass regenerate the lives of the faithful, and uh, that's it. So just transmit what we have received. Father, this is very reminiscent in my mind, of an email that we discussed on the show several programs ago where a, a viewer asked, what if the Society of St. Pius X, uh, their, their role, their function is to uh, serve as more of a lifeboat than a warship? And, and I believe at the time, Father, you, you pointed out that that's, that's not Catholic, that none of the, the, the popes, I mean, look at their, their namesake, St. Pius X. Uh, he was not one to simply... Uh, you know, not mount any, any offensive whatsoever. And if you, you read the Gospels, you, you see that our, that our Lord does that time and time again throughout the Gospels, mount some kind of offensive and, and not just be uh, some kind of pacifist or something. But it almost seems that this is what uh, Father, Father Pagliarani would have us do, just kind of meekly submit to everything that Francis does and just focus on transmitting what we have well, received. Well, transmitting what we receive has to do with both teaching the truth and condemning error. Okay, this is the authority that Christ gave to his church. 
we are, we refer to the church here on earth as the church militant, mm -hmm. militants, okay? And we are militating for the truth, and we are militating against error, okay? Right. The church has always condemned error, and this is part of the problem. Monsieur Lefebvre, no matter what the circumstances were, if he saw the church's teaching was under attack, he would speak boldly and in a forthright fashion against the error. He would condemn the error. Now, he wouldn't condemn the error in a, in a, in a, in a furious, um, frantic sort of way. Sure. Uh, he would condemn the error. Uh, actually, you, one received the impression from him uh, of, in a, in a certain deep, deep conviction, but a certain sadness and a sorrow at seeing the church attacked in this way, you know, by the modernists. But nonetheless, nothing could silence him when the truth was at stake, or when the truth was being sacrificed, Tom. He spoke clearly. And this is what we don't see in the Society of St. Pius X right now, or the other, as I say, would-be traditional groups who are trying so desperately to curry some favor in Rome. And... Um, see some advantage to having that favor that they don't want to lose. Um, you know, when I speak, I know, sometimes I give the impression that uh, I'm very passionate about it, um, that I'm, you know, I'm possibly angry or upset. But actually, it, it really is a matter. I mean, I know a goodly number of people who are in the Society of St. the Tenth. I know a goodly number of priests who are in the Society of St. the Tenth. I myself was a member of the Society of St. Pius X, was ordained by Monsieur Lefebvre. And I just, it, it really, really hurts a great deal to see the Society of St. Pius X going this way. You know, there's a certain connection, I feel there, that it, it uh, I, I'm concerned about the priests, I'm concerned about the lay people, so many very, very good people there who have the faith, and are, are following, and they're just kind of not only blindly following, they're told to blindly follow. They're told to not question anything. Well, if that's how it started back in the 1960s and 70s, we'd all be, we'd all be Amazonian, or indigenous people, Catholic, so to speak. We'd all be modernists. And, uh, you know, that by the grace of God, we're not. So, um, but I, I, I fear the message that is coming down the line now is exactly what the modernists were telling us. And now in the Society of Supplies X, the hierarchy of the, well, they consider themselves a hierarchy of the Society of St. Pius X. Don't question. Don't question. <clears throat> even don't question, you know, who ordained somebody. Don't even ask how so-and-so was ordained. You know, they're, they're using novus ordo priests who are not ordained in the traditional right by a traditional bishop. Don't question. You know, it's stone wall right there. Talk about hitting a brick wall. <laughs> and these are the tactics that the modernists used. <clears throat> and I see as the society is more and more into this, the, the, the same tactics are being applied, you know, that the modernists used back then. So, um, <clears throat> Now, it's out of a genuine concern for all of those involved. And um, I, I do pray for them all, you know, continue to pray for them all. Um, in any case, when we talk about transmitting what we have received, okay, this is straight out of sacred scripture, that this is what we have to give. I give you what I have received. St. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, chapter 11, talking about the Blessed Sacrament, talking about our Lord's consecration of his body and blood, and how that very consecration of the body and blood of Christ at the Mass, as St. Paul says, proclaims the death of the Lord. That's a sacri the sacrificial death of our Lord until he comes. And that is what the Mass is. That's what the Mass means the consecration of the very body and blood of Jesus Christ, showing forth the sacrificial death of our Lord on Calvary, until the end of time, until our Lord comes to judge mankind. This is what we have to transmit, as it were. 
You know, this is what St. Paul tells us. He's transmitting in 1 Corinthians. So, you know, I understand what Father Pagliarani is saying. We have to pass on that traditional mass. I, I agree with that. But he also says the traditional mass and all, all that accompanies it. It's the pinnacle of the entire faith. So you have the entire faith that goes into that. I mean, the very person of our Lord Jesus Christ present there in this sacrament we know as the Blessed Sacrament. And um, the Church has had to defend that against all enemies, Luther and Zwingli and Calvin and Berengarius before them and others before them. And um, the, the problem that we find in the past, though, was when there have even been popes who have tried to accommodate error, such as Honorius I, they wound up betraying the church because they allowed the inconvenience that would come in from opposing the error. They, they, they allowed that to persuade them to adopt a policy of silence and fail to condemn the error for what it was. And the entire church suffered. Souls were lost. Martyrs were made of the men who would not be silenced, but who condemned the error and did what they should have done. And this is because of the, of the failure of, of a pope, Honorius I, you know, who later on, within two generations, at an actual ecumenical council of the church, was condemned, given the status of a heretic, because he failed to oppose the heresy, and was even excommunicated, post-mortem, you know, after his death. And uh, this is the gravity of the situation we're dealing with here. So we can't, you know, shrink from the truth because we feel we have some advantage to be gained by accommodating the error in any way. We have to reveal it for exactly what it is. That's simply a matter of following the example of our Lord and all the saintly popes we've uh, been given, gifted by God throughout history. Well, Father, I wanted to read through an email that uh, we just recently received because it's exactly what we are talking about here. And so this viewer mentions how we have been uh, referencing the, uh, quote, non-action from the SSPX and FSSP, the Fraternity of St. Peter, and uh, how we express that there are virtually no differences between the FSSP and SSPX. Uh, this viewer says, I believe there is one major difference between the two fraternities, and that is that we have certainty that the Society of St. Pius X priests have been validly ordained by any one of the four Lefebvre bishops. However, the Fraternity of St. Peter priests, even though using the traditional rite, are ordained by Novus Ordo bishops who themselves have doubtful consecrations. Many good Catholics, myself included, are quite possibly deceived by this inconvenient fact. If I'm not mistaken, Monsignor Lefebvre stated on no less than one occasion that Novus Ordo ordinations are doubtful in their validity, but Novus Ordo consecrations are definitely invalid. Please provide further clarity on this, Father. So is that true, Father, that the Society of St. Pius X priests, we are absolutely certain that their ordinations are valid because they are done by one of the four validly consecrated no, bishops? No, no. Why not? No, because they do, they do, and even back when I was still with the Society of St. Pius V, they did have priests saying Mass in their chapels who were ordained by the Novus Ordo, by a Novus Ordo, no, with the Novus Ordo ceremony, and by a Novus Ordo consecrated bishop. They did. They actually had priests who were ordained only Novus Ordo in their churches offering Mass for their people. Do they still do that today? Father? And the best of my information is they, yes, absolutely do. So it's the best of my information. They're still using priests who have not been conditionally ordained. Does that mean then that there is a... In the traditional right, by a true traditional Catholic bishop. In this regard, then, is there essentially no difference between the Fraternity of St. Peter and the Society of St. Peter? It would be merely a difference of degree, but not, not in principle, no. Okay. No. There would not be a difference in, in principle, you know, as to 
how they regard the new order ordinations. Um, I know firsthand of a case where um, we were told uh, by Monsieur Le himself that um, of two priests who are ordained in the Novus Ordo who are actually um, serving as priests in, in Society of St. Pius X chapels, uh, who are ordained, two priests who are ordained in the new rite by Novus Ordo bishops, that Monsignor Lefebvre did conditionally consecrate, uh, ordain one and not the other. And when we asked him why one and not the other, Monsignor Lefebvre said, well, because the one agreed to it and the other did not. He said the one priest had no doubts about the validity of his own ordination. And so he opted out. And were the faithful aware of that, Father? Uh, there were faith, faithful were made aware of that. Yeah. 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 Okay. But um, disappointing, to say the least, right? Definitely. Father, uh, as though that should be the deciding factor. Yeah. What do you make of this, Father? In the same email, this viewer says, I've heard priests say that there is no need to decipher whether orders are valid or not because every priest simply knows he's a priest. They have an internal or a spiritual certainty. Is that true, Father? No, that's absolutely not true. Okay. There are plenty of people who are convinced that they're priests who are not. And, uh, well, there might be, on the other hand, those who are and are convinced that they're not, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, so, uh, no, th there is no such, such intuition of whether one is validly ordained a priest or not. That is okay. not true. Okay. Well, Father, I have a lot more that I'd like to get to, but uh, I think, yeah. unfortunately, we're... Well, I think you've got something there, even on the question of, what is it, uniting the clans, is that right? Right, yeah, this um, Michael Matt and Taylor Marshall and another uh, similar, however you want to classify them, conservative, no mm. sort of ways, possibly, uh, they have this... Uh, That's kind of an interesting comment there from... Uh, what is it, Dymphna's blog? Dymphna's, Dymphna's Road. Uh, Dymphna's Road. Right, right, yeah. right. That's a blogger, a yeah. blog site. It's, it's it is an interesting commentary from someone who is aware of Michael Matt, mm -hmm. the remnant, call, saying, call in the clans. Unite the clans. Unite yeah. the clans, basically trying to rally all of the conservative Novus Ordo people who want the traditional mass. Right, all, all of the groups who love the traditional mass, and uh, they say that we should ignore the at times deep differences and all come together and uh, they say their argument is that it is relatively little stuff that divides and that it is nothing compared to the one thing that we all love what do you think about that well the, the whole idea of uniting the clans i i mean i i think it is gained a great deal of uh let's say blog time out there <laughs> right uh, a lot of uh, bites in the digital world mm -hmm. as people are disputing what he means and disputing how practical it is. I understand that uh, Michael Matt has even taken the uh, picture of um, Mel Gibson from his movie uh, uh, Wallace uh, uniting the clans of the Irish against the English and put his own, Michael Matt put his own face there, right? Behind the, uh, the, the 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 war paint, which is kind of a peculiar uh, way of representing this, but you know, Tom, the, the the problem ultimately comes down to, as they're all saying. I mean, the people are on there saying, "Yes, unite the clans," but how do we do it? We can't yeah. agree. We just can't agree. That's on exactly how, how she ends it. Yeah. yeah. So we can't even agree on who would we would unite, unite under, let alone what we. Where we have points of agreement, we also have points of disagreement. We can't just dis, you know, disavow them. It's an illustration of the, what I was saying there about the division among traditional Catholics. Even is not about faith, really, because we all would hold the the Catechism of the Council of Trent, the Roman Catechism, and say, "This I believe." Right. Every single one of us. Right. 
And uh, it's not really about worship because we all want the traditional Mass, the traditional Roman Rite of Mass. And uh, you might say, well, government, that's what separates us, right? Not really, because we're all saying we're traditional Catholics. So we're all saying, let's rally around tradition. Hey, even the Novus Ordo conservatives, right, who are concerned about Francis right now and say, look, we can't listen to him. <clears throat> even Father Pagliarani, well, he doesn't speak for the magisterium of the church and he doesn't speak for Christ. We have to rally around tradition as our guide. But it comes down to the very practical order of this. There are many of these groups that call themselves traditional who really are not. They are not really following Catholic tradition. And this is where the division comes in. And these are not insignificant questions. As this writer said here, you know, there are a lot of little things we disagree on. No, they're not little things, you know. It's a matter of what Catholic tradition says. I mean, there are, there are certain things, as we read in the history of the Church, that Catholics must do to be Catholics, okay? And there are certain other things that Catholics must never do to be Catholics. There are things the Church has said are absolutely necessary for a Catholic to remain a Catholic, and there are certain things with the Church in her history has said there are certain things which can never be done by Catholics and that are always wrong. That, that is because they, that, that is, they always violate Catholic tradition. <coughs> There are other things that the Church has allowed in missionary times, in times of persecution and so on, that would not ordinarily be allowed. Um, but we know what those things are. Why? Because we have the Church's history to guide us. There we see her tradition. And there we can see how she judged these things. And if we all would follow those judgments, we could be united. Because we all would be, in fact, following Catholic tradition. But when you have a group of would-be traditionalists who say, well, we have the power to give marriage annulments. And you say, well, actually you don't. And they say, well, if we have the power to validly marry people, we certainly have, must have the power to validly unmar you know, to grant marriage annulments. You say, but there's no precedent in Catholic tradition for that. You can't claim that. And they say, well, we're going to do that anyway. Or let's say you have a traditional Catholic group that says, we insist that Francis is the Pope, no doubt about it. You can't even question whether he's the Pope. Because if you even question that he's the Pope, if it occurs to you that he, it's possible he might not be, you're a saint of a contest. And then the same people who say, Francis is the Pope, you cannot even begin to consider the possibility of questioning it. But they say, but we don't have to do anything he says. That is not Catholic tradition speaking. That, that is almost the very definition of schism. Say, so if, if Francis authorizes us to do this, okay, great, we're okay with it. If he says, no, you can't do it, well, we'll do it anyway. It doesn't really matter, okay? Um, that's the very definition of schism. So how do you not unite with a group like that, if you want to be traditional? How do you unite with a group that says, look, the bishop from which we all draw our, our holy orders actually was consecrating non-Catholics who were actually involved in the occult. But actually, that just applies to him. It doesn't apply to anybody else. It certainly doesn't carry over to us. But you say, well, wait a minute, there are consequences. If a Catholic bishop is doing that, the law of the church excommunicates him for doing that. So if he's, if he's excommunicated for doing that, then how do you claim that his consecration of you made you a Catholic bishop when the law of the church says he can't function as a Catholic bishop? Well, they just brush that aside as though it doesn't matter. But that is contrary to all Catholic tradition to do that. So no wonder there are divisions among those claiming to be traditional because there are so many, in fact, in practice who aren't. And this is, again, you know, who can overcome that? A true Catholic Pope is the only one who can. Um, and the Holy Ghost, the inspiration of the Holy Ghost there. But uh, the fact is, I mean, if we're going to be traditional Catholics, we have to be honest about it and follow Catholic tradition. 
when it's convenient and when it's not convenient, no matter what, because that's our rule that we have to follow. And we can only be united in following that Catholic tradition because there you find the authority of the Holy Ghost. And that's every Catholic Pope has to find his authority in Catholic tradition. He, the papacy itself exists for that, to protect that, to foster that Catholic tradition, not to attack it. So, in any case, Tom, um, again, you know, we're going to, uh, if we're going to claim to follow Catholic tradition, let's be honest about it and do it. And let's just face the fact that you cannot unite the clans around Catholic tradition unless all the clans, so to speak, are willing to follow Catholic tradition and be true to it. Exactly. So. Well, Father, to end on a, uh, a more positive note, if we could. Oh, I thought this was very positive. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, Father, in, in, this, uh, in this month of, of September, we, uh, we have many beautiful feasts of the Blessed Mother. The entire month is, mm -hmm. is dedicated to the Sorrowful Mother. And just a matter of days ago, we celebrated the Feast of the Holy Name of Mary. Uh, Father, what, what, what is this, the significance of, of this feast? Why do we celebrate the Holy Name of Mary? What's the significance of that? What do we have to learn from that? Well, the Holy Name of Mary is actually a title. It's not just a, a, a name given arbitrarily. Um, the name Jesus assigned to our Lord was not just a name but the Blessed Mother and St. Joseph thought sounded nice so let's, let's name uh, our Lord. It was given by heaven by God the Father in heaven naming his own son and the word Yeshua means Savior it has many variations Jesus, Jesu in Latin or in Italian right? and uh, Jesse Right is another form of that. Joshua is another form of it too. Right. But they all go back to the root, which means Savior. And this was a title. This was a mission. Literally, our Lord was sent into the world by the Father to accomplish the redemption. And so, he not only is Jesus by name, he is Jesus by, well, his, the very incarnation is the fulfillment of that mission to be the savior of the world, of mankind, of the faithful, ultimately, those who are truly faithful to him. <clears throat> but um, the same with Mary. I mean, in the earliest days of Revelation, just after the fall of mankind, God promised to send <clears throat> a woman who would be the mother <clears throat> of the savior. And this woman, we read in Genesis chapter three, verse 15, Everyone should go and look that up. If they don't know it by heart, they should go and look it up right now. Genesis 3.15. <clears throat> they should see that God said that this woman <clears throat> would be the enemy of Satan. That he would be her enemy. Never her ally. Never the ally of Satan, I should say. As Eve became. Right? right? This woman would be the enemy of Satan. And that is her mission. And the, the title, she would be the woman. And you notice that in the Gospels, our Lord referred to his mother Mary as woman. At the wedding feast of Cana, and even from the cross, as our Lord was giving Mary, his own mother, to St. John, and entrusting her to his care. He referred to her by that noble title of woman, because she is the fulfillment of that prophecy. When we honor the name of Mary, we are honoring the prophecy of God. We're actually honoring the God who promised her and fulfilled that promise to send this noble woman into the world. And uh, unlike Eve, who had lost her nobility in sin, this woman was conceived in grace. <clears throat> and uh, through the Immaculate Conception, and maintain that nobility, that spiritual nobility through her life, absolutely sinless. We refer that to that as her immaculate heart. So uh, that is the significance of this wonderful feast day. This year we had the dedication of our school year at Immaculate Conception Academy on that feast day with the procession of Our Lady, uh, Our Lady's statue, and uh, it was a very beautiful event. We do that each year. 
sometimes on September 8th, sometimes on September 15th, depending on the weather, <laughs> and sometimes in the middle of those two, September 12th, because you have that, that week, September 8th, celebrating the birth of Our Lady, her nativity, a week later, September 15th, the Seven Sorrows of Our Lady. And between the two, September 12th, the honor of Our Blessed Mother's name as the woman prophesied to be the mother of the Savior. This year, September 8th and September 15th fell on Sundays. Um, and our student school was not in session. So fortunately, the church provided a feast day right between the two. And uh, we uh, took it, the opportunity on that feast day to honor our lady and to entrust to her our school year. Well, I think that's a little bit more positive than the, the rest of the programs. Thank you, Father. <laughs> well, Tom, I, I, I take your word for action. I hope so. Um, in the church's mind, though, speaking, standing up for the truth and condemning the error are both positive. You know, there, there's no real distinction between standing up for the truth and condemning what is what is contrary to the truth. They're not they're not negative. We we negativize them, so to speak. You know. Um, but when our Lord spoke so solemnly during the uh, during his public life, you know, uh, I, I know sometimes he would say, "Amen, amen." I say unto you, you know, this or that. Some, I guess, to us would sound rather positive, others would sound negative, but our Lord teaching us is teaching us the way to save our souls. How to not go to hell, but how to go to heaven and have everlasting life. Uh, there's nothing negative about either one of those, <laughs> about our Lord's teaching us in that regard. So, um, so I would hope uh, that uh, all of those who watch what Catholics believe would take what we say for the positive um, sure. I hope and pray that that will be the case. <laughs> so, God bless all of our viewers here. Definitely. Well, thank you, Father. Appreciate your time. Oh, certainly, too. Thanks to all of our viewers as well for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady at Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and also to pray and do penance. Thank you, and God bless you. <laughs>